specify the direction of the loop. So let's go ahead and discuss that. Okay, so in the last class, we were uh, continuing our venture into negative feedback. So I received this question at the end of the last class. I think it's worth mentioning uh, once. So in this case, when we were, uh, we are trying to find out the loop gain, whether it's a negative feedback uh, or not. So we, we are making an inherent assumption. The assumption is uh, the signal flow direction is this way in the loop, right? So uh, in the block diagram representation, it's quite simple to identify which side is the signal flow if it's, if it's given to you. And for example, in this case, uh, implicitly we know that this direction of signal flow is not allowed because we assume that G and H are unidirectional and signal flows from left to left, from left to right on G and right to left through H, right? But in many cases, say your uh, circuits are not like that, but in some cases they are. For example, uh, the examples that we have been taking till now, uh, let's take, Only exam, real example of uh, negative feedback that we have taken. What's wrong? So in this case, uh, there was this question, which is a legitimate question that when we were trying to, we are trying to break the loop here, right? We are breaking the loop there and applying a test voltage here and finding out the return voltage at that node. But what about, I mean, since this is a loop, so what about the case, if I apply the test voltage here, and try to go around the loop in this direction, right? So in this case, can you comment on for the equivalence of this with respect to the GH analogy? Can I go around the loop in the direction that is shown in the, in, in the bottom circuit? Is the question clear? I'm trying to find out the loop gain, and there is a loop, right? Once you have it, let's say, I mean, you can have a loop in any way, right? So, so should, how do I know? Do I need to go around the loop this way, or do I need to go around the loop that way? Uh, can you, I couldn't hear you. Transistor will not? It's not on. What do you mean by that? Transistor on as in, I mean, I am not from the biasing here. So transistor will be biased. Otherwise, all these things are in small signal, right? So it's not as if I'm physically break, breaking the loop. We'll see later on how we, we are going to break the loop. But even though we are breaking the loop, we are assuming that all the small signal conditions are still valid. Because, I mean, ultimately, the, your circuit is with everything connected, right? Ultimately, a circuit is a circuit exists with everything connected. This breaking the loop business we are doing just for our understanding of what will be the loop gain. But if I break the loop and the operating conditions of the transistor changes, then obviously I'm not doing the right analysis. Because ultimately we are trying to figure out what is the loop gain, assuming the transistor is in saturation. 
or in properly biased condition, which will be the same as in the case of loop. So it's not as if the trans I'm breaking the loop and means the uh, circuit goes out, right? For it. So if that is not comfortable, you can think of in this way. So your small or small signal model is this. This is VE, this is GMVE. Okay. So the values of the GM and if the GDS exists, they have been extracted from the DC operating points. Right? Now we are trying to understand, given that under the small signal condition, what is the loop gain? But in order to understand what is the loop gain, first we have to identify the loop. We have to identify the direction of signal flow. So what I am, uh, the question that was raised was, can we apply a test voltage here? Obviously, this has to be grounded. And try to find out what is the return voltage. So do you see do you think this is uh, this is accurate? This is okay, this is not okay. What is your opinion about this? Now, can you repeat? So, so firstly, do you think I can go around the loop in any direction or there is a preference? There is a preference. Why do you think there is a preference? Um, not really, right? These are incremental. In incremental, the current should be, it can go in any direction. VGS can also be negative. Mm -hmm. Incremental positive means I've applied a, I mean, small increment going up. Incremental negative means I've applied a small increment going down. Right? So it can I the direction, the absolute direction of uh, the incremental current doesn't matter. This VKS can as well be a sinusoid, right? It can go up, it can go down. So again, uh, think from the perspective of the stuff on the top, right? So in this case, the error amplifier is what? The error amplifier is? Something is wrong with this. It's not detecting. Let me be draw here. So in this case, do you think, uh, I mean, the equivalence of, of the circuit on the top and the bottom is this, right? So, so when I break the loop, I'm breaking the loop here. And what I did in class the other day was I applied a test voltage here. And sorry, not this way. And we went around the loop and figured out what was the return voltage at this node. This was the return. So what I'm essentially asking is, can I do the other way around? Can I say that I will apply the test voltage here? and find out the return voltage at this node. This is VE. That's the question. 
is that a valid way of breaking the loop and trying to find out the loop there? Yes, no. Still hungover from yesterday night. Should not be possible. Uh, any of you think it's possible, then we can discuss that also. Is the question clear? Or am I, I mean, it's so clear that I am basically overemphasizing. It's so obvious. Can be either. But since the question was raised, I was, I wanted to make the point. Because sometimes it's very obvious, sometimes it's not. If the circuit is, has multiple transistors, multiple loops, it's not always obvious whether which direction the signal flows. I am asking you, what is uh, what is your opinion? I can build on that. Right? What is your opinion? Do you think the, uh, if I apply a phase voltage here and go down the loop and figure out the return voltage here, that is acceptable? Or if I apply the phase voltage here, go around the loop in this direction and try to figure out what is it? That is acceptable. What is no? Why not? So, ah, so essentially it's unidirectional. A transistor is unidirectional. Right? So a signal cannot flow between drain to gate. Unless there is explicit feedback. That's a different thing. But in, in a transistor is a unidirectional device. You excite something at the gate, something happens at the drain. It's not necessary that you excite something at the drain, something happens at the gate. That's not going to happen, right? Yes, that correct? If I, if I excite something at the gate, something is going to happen at the drain. But if you excite something at the drain, magically nothing is going to happen at the gate. Right? It's a unidirectional device, right? So the signal always flows from gate to drain, unless there is a feedback. But in this case, we have the whole purpose of finding out the loop gain is breaking the feedback. If I break the feedback, which means that there's, there is not supposed to be any connection between drain and gate, which means that if I excite something at the drain, if I excite at this node and I go all the around, all around here and arrive at the drain, I will not get anything at the gate, right? So a negative feedback loop is always essentially saying loop gain is zero, right? That is also not a negative feedback loop, right? So, so, so uh, whenever in doubt, go back to this to this analogy of of, of this circuit, of this um, block diagram, and try to argue with yourself which direction is the signal is flowing. And in most cases, you will see that once you identify what is the error amplifier, right? Once you identify which is the error amplifier, then it becomes pretty obvious which direction the signal is flowing, and you can break and go along. Right? So, so as long as that is clear, we can move on. Is that fine? Okay. Okay, so uh, the stuff that we were dealing with in the previous class was uh, the frequency response of the feedback system in the context of the loop, if we already know what the loop gain is. So, I think I have to restart once. This is not working out. Okay, so we were uh, discussing negative feedback loop in the context of uh, the frequency dependent uh, components. And then we, okay, so let's, this. Okay, one last try.
Okay, so uh, so in this case, we figured that this uh, the loop n of this was of the form of if I break the loop here. If I break the loop here, apply a test voltage there. I don't know. I'm pointing, but it's not coming. Out. This is part of the screen that's above. So if I break the loop here and apply a test voltage there and find out the return voltage at this node, then this was of the form, the loop gain was of the form of some DC gain by one plus one by. Uh, 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 by one plus s by p one, where p one was the was the uh, um, pole of the pole associated with the with the loop. Okay, and then we also said that so if I plot the loop gain, there will be a p one here, and there will be a ugb of the loop gain, and the ugb of the loop gain was what in this context? What? Pardon? What is the UGB? This should be like second nature now, right? A not P1, right? Good. Okay. A not P1. Fine. And then we also said that if we close the loop now and try to find out what is V0 over VI, right? Uh, in this case, if R1, if R2 equal to 2 R1, let's say, if R2 equal to 2 R1, what is the expected V0 over VI? Pardon? In R2 equal to 2 R1 then? Not really 3, right? So if R2 is equal to 2 R1, then what is going to happen? Under ideal condition, uh, assuming that your loop gain is infinity and all, all the good things, then what is going to be V0 over VI? What is going to be the error voltage? Zero. So if error voltage is zero, if error voltage is zero, then what is going to be V0? Not really VI, right? If V is zero, what is the current? Vi by R. So V not equal to minus two Vi. Ideally, but in this case, there will be a steady state error because there was a our loop gain is not infinity. So there will be some steady state error, right? And steady state error you can figure out. But uh, what I'm trying to get at here is that your output will be probably be two plus some error, right? So approximately two, but if you have to be more nitpicky about it, it will be two plus some error. And this will be it, this will be flat, more or less flat till the UGB of the loop, and then this will go down at twenty dB per decade, right? Okay, fine. So what is this UGB of the loop now? Uh, sorry, what is this three dB frequency? This is equal to this UGB, right? UGB of the open loop system. So this is becomes a not b one. Now, uh, if I apply, let's say, a step input here. Right, so let's say we are in time domain. I'm plotting in time domain now. So let's say vi is a step, maybe a hundred millivolt step. So firstly, what do you expect v not to be? These are all incremental, not total. These are all incremental. Increment VI is an incremental step of let's say 100 millivolt. What do you expect V not to be ideally? A step or this also should be a step or that could be anything else? Ideally, 
it should be a step of value minus 200, right? So it should be a step of value minus 200. This is an ideal expectation, but in reality, it will not be minus 200, there will be some error, right? So maybe that will not be minus 200, maybe it will be something like slightly less than 200. Okay, fine. So, so now if we have a capacitor associated with this node, then we are going to have this frequency limitation, right? If there is no capacitor, then the gain persists for all frequencies. If we have a capacitor, there will be a frequency limitation. So, which means now in the presence of capacitor and let's say, I mean, the 3 dB frequency of, I mean, instead of calling the 3 dB frequency, let's say that this is what you know about your, uh, about your uh, frequency characteristics. You know the loop gain, you know the closed loop transfer function also. And you comment on how V0 will look like in the presence of a step. The question is now, if I, if I, this is ideal, right? Whatever I have drawn here is an ideal scenario. This is, do you think this is in the presence of the capacitor or in the absence of the capacitor? In the absence of the capacitor, right? I, the, the circuit is responding immediately, right? There is no frequency, there is no sluggishness, which means there is no, any frequency can go through. You have a step, step goes through immediately. But if you have a capacitor and you have this first order response, right? Uh, the one that I have shown here, this is your V0 over VI. So now what I'm asking is that in the presence of a capacitor, how will the output behave? Uh, rise time as in, what do you mean by rise time? Okay, so do you, rise time can be many things, right? It can be like this, or in this case, we know spoil time, but it can be like this. It should be an exponential settling, right? Like that, that, that of a first order circuit, right? And what do you characterize an exponential settling for a first order circuit? What is the key term for that? Time constant, right? So what is the time constant of this guy? What will be the tau of this settling? From the knowledge of whatever you have done till mid sem and looking at this, can you tell me? What is four? Four what? Ah, okay, P1 will be one by, correct, but I mean, again, let me repeat. The question is, what will be the tau for V0, right? So looking at these plots, can you tell me what will be tau? Three R plus RD into C, how? Okay, let, let's, let, let's not get into the details of the circuit, we'll get into that, but uh, let's say let's say you are given these two plots in terms of a naught p one. Uh, can you tell me one over one over a naught p one, right? Great. So tau will be one over a naught p one. In other or other words, tau will be essentially one over the omega u loop. Right? This is the first order system, so that's why it becomes quite simple. So this is the this is the response. This is the response. This is the response of your closed loop system. It has a pole at certain location. That pole location happens to be the open loop UGB. And then since I know in, in case of a first order system, time constant relates to pole as one over reciprocal of each other, then I know that the way the this circuit will settle for uh, when when excited with a step the settling time constant will be one what omega u loop right so multiple steps connected but i hope you are comfortable with that with this now okay okay fine so now uh, uh, so if i uh, now let's delve into what will be this omega u loop for this circuit so uh, so let's assume that
So if I have to find out the loop gain, so I'll, this is a first order circuit, loop gain should not be very difficult to find, but I'll make further approximations. Let's, let's assume that uh, the RD is such that it's not, I mean, R2R is much higher than RD, which means that uh, all the incremental current through this guy is flowing into either RD or the capacitor, not into that R2R network, which means this voltage is minus GM, Rd by one plus s by p. What is what will be the? I'll come to what will be the p. Uh, so, so in this case, actually, it's quite simple to find out what is the p. So this becomes gm by gd plus sc times vi. So this is the voltage there. So what is the return voltage? divided by three, right? So this becomes minus GM VI by three GT plus SC, okay? So, so then you know what is the loop gain. Loop gain becomes GM by three GT plus SC, okay? So, and if I have to express in that form of poles and everything, so this becomes GMRD by three, times one by one plus SRDC. Okay, so so now uh, if you know that you want to settle fast, right? Uh, so what will be the omega U loop in this case? If you, you know that in, if you want to settle fast, which means you want very small time constant, you have to do something with omega U loop. So you need to increase omega U loop or decrease? I want the output settling to be really sharp. I don't want to wait for a long time. So should I increase omega U loop or decrease omega U loop? Increase, right? Great. So now what then, which means I need to actually find out what is omega U loop. So what is omega U loop? I can't hear. No, that's not omega U loop. So this is of what form? This is of the form of A0 by 1 plus S by P. What is A0? GMRD over 3, what is P? So what is omega U loop? Omega U loop is the that frequency at which the loop gain goes to unity. So at what frequency the loop gain is going to unity? GM by 3C, right? GM by 3C. Should not be surprising because ultimately at when, when the capacitor dominates, all the current is supposed to go into the capacitor. So the, this voltage is supposed to be then, this voltage is supposed to be GM by C, GM by SC, and this voltage is one third of that. So this becomes GM by 3SC, and which means the frequency is GM by 3C. Okay, so so this becomes your omega U loop, which means if you want faster settling, given that you let's say you cannot change C, what do you need to do? You need to increase GM to ensure that the system settles fast. Right? Make sense? Okay, fine. So now, uh, uh, so 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 a first order system by definition. <laughs> Now let's come come back to uh, let's come back to the stability of the system. We were discussing stability at the end of the previous class. Uh, in a first order system, by by its very nature, is always stable, right? It, it, I mean, uh, one way to easily figure out from time domain whether it will be stable or not is to give a step input and see whether the output goes like rings like crazy or goes out of bound. It basically, in control system paradigm, we call this bounded input, bounded output stability, right? So for any uh, bounded input, your output should not go unbounded. In a first order system, that's not going to happen because in a first order system, the settling is always exponential. It will settle to some value, right? So uh, so it's quite evident uh, by looking into a first order system why it is going to be uh, always stable. However, it's not particularly evident if the system has more poles. In a higher order system, we have to then establish what will be the uh, condition for stability and we saw one example at the end of the previous class where 
under certain condition, the loop can becoming equal to minus one, your system can become unstable, right? So, so let's, uh, uh, so which essentially means that we need to find out a framework, we need to develop a framework as to how to figure out whether the system is actually stable or unstable, or if it is stable, how far it is from instability. Right? It's not only uh, sufficient to say that I'm just working at the edge of the cliff. I need to know how much margin I have also, right? So that I don't fall over. Okay. So, so let's, let's go into that now. So let's say that we have, uh, we have a second order system. By the way, I mean, uh, why do we need a second order system to the, in the first place? We need a second order system because ultimately, what is a loop gain a function of? A loop gain is a function of GM times, uh, for example, the DC loop gain in this case is function of GM times RD. Okay. And why do we, again, why do we need high loop gain? Loop gain has nothing to do, I mean, the time constant is a, is a byproduct of things, but we need high loop gain. Why? Uh, not necessarily high UGB also. Like UGB came much later, but why did we want to get high loop gain in the first place? Minimize? Minimize error, right? Ultimately, I want infinite loop gain. If the loop gain is infinite, output, the examples that we have taken in this case, output all will always be. 2 times minus 2 times vi, that is the ideal scenario. But for that to happen, our loop gain has to be really high. Loop gain has to be really high means gm times rt has to be really high, which means the gain of this amplifier has to be really high. And uh, from your experience of designing a simple common source amplifier, you saw that it's not trivial to, to get a really large gain, right? So uh, given that your power supply is limited and so on. So one way to get rid of the problem is to say, instead of putting one common source amplifier, I'll put two of them. Right, one driving another. If one of them gives me a gain of 10, the two of them will give me gain of 100. So that's definitely 10 times better than the previous one. If I'm not satisfied, I'll put another one, I'll get a gain of 1000. Right, so I can keep on cascading one amplifier after another. So in principle, I should be able to get really large gain. Right, but the issue is let's say I put two of them together. Again, I'm not showing the DC biasing. Uh, we'll, uh, I'm assuming the DC biasing is set up. So let's do the same thing again. So let's say these are identical common source amplifiers. They are put together and they're in a negative feedback, right? So, so let's say I have some negative feedback around it. A minus one R. And in order to figure out loop gain, I don't need VI. I can as well short this guy. And then if I find out the loop gain, right, what should I see? I, I already know that there is a capacitor here. I know that there is a capacitor here. Right. Let me call this C1. Let me call this C2. Okay. C1 and C2 can also be identical, but let's distinguish between C1 and C2. <clears throat> and I try to find out the loop gain. By the way, how do I know whether <clears throat> the, the sense of the loop is correct or not? Can you look at this and tell me if the sense of the loop is correct? Is it a negative feedback or positive feedback? How do you know? Right, great. I, yeah. So that's exactly what it is. So you hypothetically break the loop here, give an increment. If this increases, this guy decreases, this guy increases, this increases, but there is a negative sign through the summer. So again, this, so this guy decreases. So it's a negative feedback, right? Fine. So now, uh, why don't you tell me what will be the loop gain of, of this, right? Calculate and tell me what will be the loop gain. You can assume this to be GM. Uh, GM1 and GM2. Okay, so if I express it in this form, uh, 
dc gain by 1 plus poles and so on. 1 plus s by p1 plus s by p1 p2 those things so what will be the dc gain so i want to express it in this form a naught by 1 plus s by p1 1 plus s by p2 clearly it has two poles i mean that should be pretty evident but uh, so now what is a naught how can a naught should be independent of units right gm1 gm2 by k is not unitless so what is a naught ah right so approximately that because uh, the first stage dc gain is gm1 times rd second stage dc gain is gm2 times rd parallel those three uh, i mean those two registers right gm2 rd parallel kr and one third of that is getting fed back so this by 3 is uh, is a not and if i assume that feedback register are not loading then i can say that this becomes gm1 gm2 rd squared by 3 so this is assuming rd is much less than kr fine so this is a not what is p1 let's say i am associating p1 with a with the capacitor c1 so what will be p1 1 over rdc1 time constant is rdc1 so p1 is 1 over rdc1 what will be p2 p2 associated with the time constant of c2 rd parallel kr by c2 right 1 over that so since I am anyway assuming R D to be much less, so this becomes approximately R D times C two. Okay, fine. So so if again C one and C two are of the same order, then you see P one and P two will also be of similar order, right? So so loop gain with respect to omega, you have. A relatively high loop gain, like at least the square of that of a one common source amplifier. But you have a P1 here, maybe P2 here. So this 20 dB per decade, 40 dB per decade goes like this. Okay. How about the phase? The phase will start from zero. Around P1, it should drop by approximately 45 degree. But now here P1 and P2 close to each other. So I cannot really take them in isolation. But I know that it will drop. How much it will drop will, will can be figured out from calculations. We can do that later. But the other key thing that we know is that instead of this uh, phase settling to minus 90 degree, it will settle to minus 180, right? It will settle to minus 180. So in a first order system, the phase would have settled to minus 90. In a second order system, the phase settles to minus 180. Now this readily should uh, should tell you that something problematic can happen because ultimately for the instability criterion to be set, we need to be away from DC gain of 1 and loop gain of 1 and phase of 180. Right? Because L of minus 1 is a problematic scenario right l of minus 1 means loop can magnitude is 1 and phase is 180 in a first order system the phase cannot ever go to minus 180 in a second order system it can which means uh, you have to be watchful right so uh, so we can do that we'll do that eventually but we, even before doing that what i would like to do is is uh, go down a road which i'm sure you are familiar with uh, so v not over vi is essentially h infinity 1 by 1 plus 1 over l right so in this case the way i have drawn h naught is 0 right because if i set set one of these forward paths to 0 there is no path between input and output if i apply the input here obviously if i apply the input here and if i observe the output here then uh, h naught will be 0, but h infinity is something that we know. What is h infinity in this case? What is h infinity by definition? The closed loop gain when the loop gain is 
infinity right so when loop gain goes to infinity what magical thing happens error voltage goes to zero if error voltage goes to zero what will be h, h infinity which voltage will go to zero if i say error voltage is going to zero so i am applying vi here error voltage is this voltage right that goes to zero which means which means what the feedback voltage is then vi if this is vi v not is k times vi so h infinity is k right so so this becomes k times 1 over now i know that l is of this form l is of this form so i'll just use this form okay so i know the a not a p1 those are in terms of component values but overall i know that this is of this form so i'll use that so this becomes 1 plus okay so expand this this becomes s squared by p2 okay so uh if a naught is much greater than one, then I can neglect that one over a naught terms, and a naught has to be much greater than one. That's the whole purpose of building the loop, right? So I I can neglect that. So this essentially becomes k times one by So I would like to express this in the form that is known to us and the form of second order system that is well known is this, right? This is a well known, I hope this is well known, right? So this is well known because I can relate the response of a second order system to zeta. Right, whether damped, under damped, and so on and so forth. So if I can do that, then I can basically relate the poles and the zeros of the loop gain to how the closed loop system will respond. Right. So so if I express that in this form, so what will I get? Uh, I have to multiply with a naught in one p two. Right. So this becomes. So in this case, uh, so if I relate these two, what do I get? Omega n to be under root a naught p one p two, and two zeta omega n is p one plus p two, which means zeta is. 1 over 2 uh, by 1 over 2, P1, P2, it's P1 plus P2. Okay, algebra is correct. Okay, fine. So, so now, since why the whole purpose of going here is because this is already we know something about this form. What do we know about this form? Can I relate the uh, the response of a second order system with respect to a step input? So in our case, so so let me sketch the circuit once again before.
So if I if I apply a step input at vi, let's say this is vi, this is with respect to time. Uh, let's say I apply a hundred millivolt step. What do I expect V naught to be? Let's say K is two. So what do I ex expect? What is the expectation? It should be a 200, a step of 200, just aligned with this, right? So this is the expectation, but what's going to happen? It's not going to, it's not going to do that. It's going to do something different. In case of a first order system, we saw what it, it was going to do. And in case of a second order system, I need an additional information. That information is that of zeta, the damping factor, right? So now let's say zeta is, let's say zeta is, uh, do you know, I mean, by the way, I'm assuming a lot of things that you know, but let's, uh, let me just quickly make the tables. Uh, so let's say zeta and type of response. So if zeta is, is uh, more than, so zeta let's say is close to zero, what do you expect the response to be? Yeah. Undamped, which means it has to be, so this is undamped, which means uh, in the time domain, what do you, what, what, what do you, uh, what do you expect to see? Right, so you should you should see something like right. So it will it will try to reach whatever it was trying to reach and go up and go down and keep on going, right? And if it's actually zero, it will never settle. But if it's close to zero, it will ultimately settle, but after like eternity. So if it is what what other things do you know about zeta? What other, let's say it's close to zero, it's undamped. Then under damped is what condition? I thought all three. <laughs> zero to one, right? So, okay, so less than one. So less than one, this is like under damped. Right. So, so in case of under damped, this doesn't go, this doesn't behave as badly. So what it, it will essentially do, it will probably, so something like this, and then eventually settle after, I mean, now depending upon how close to one or how uh, away from one it is, it is equal to one, is critically damped. So in that case, it settles, but it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't overshoot, but uh, this is uh, this is that value of zeta for which it just doesn't overshoot. Anything lesser than one, it will have slight overshoot, right? But at one, it is not going to have overshoot, and greater than one is greater than one is overdamped, which means this guy will also not overshoot, but this will be slow. Right. So this is a chart that we are familiar with from our control system courses. So so now I mean if you are if you are a designer and you know this chart, what what would you ideally be shooting for? What type of settling would you like? The equal, equal to one is something that you would like, right? So but in this case, let's say the condition the if I go back to whatever we were getting. P1 and P2 were close by, right? That's what we saw. P1 and P2 were close by because RD is similar. RD is same, C1 and C2 are similar. So P1 and P2 are close by, A0 is very high, right? If P1 and P2 are close by, then what do you, these two are like close to one individually, ratios, right? So it's essentially one over two under root A0 times two. A naught is very high, which means zeta is close to what? Zeta is close to zero, right? Which means what's going to happen? It will be become almost like undamped, but yeah, it's under damped. 
so so your system will dance like crazy right so uh, so that's not something that that we want right at least is that part clear okay so so essentially what is the conclusion the conclusion conclusion is if p1 is of the same order as p2 and a naught tends to infinity a naught is very high then we get underdamped oscillations underdamped response why zeta tends to zero so now this is not good so so which means we have to massage the equation of zeta a bit more and try to figure out what we, what else we can do so now can you give me some ideas as to how to fix this problem because ultimately we want higher order system because we want more loop gain we want more loop gain because you want more accuracy but looks like if i put a higher order system with more loop gain things are becoming unstable right so with respect to a second order system from the stuff that we know can you engineer some solution so that beta goes close to 1 <clears throat> looking at these expressions in terms of a not p1 p2 P2 becomes ah, okay, right. So if the whole issue was, I mean, see, I ultimately I want A0 to be really high. This I don't want to compromise, right? Because that's what the loop gain, entire purpose of going to negative feedback was. Right. If we don't have high A0, there's no point in going for negative feedback. So that we don't want to compromise. But the issue is becoming since P1 and P2 are close by, so this both these ratios are close to one. Uh, so essentially, you have something finite in the denominator, and numerator and infinite in the denominator. Things goes to close to zero. So what we would like to do is to ensure that this stuff, this this stuff inside the bracket, is not is also not finite. It can be of the order of a naught. So then, probably something big by something big, I can get. I have a chance to uh, make zeta to be close to one. So which essentially means that p one and p two cannot be close by. Right. So if P1 and P2 are far apart, let's assume that if P2 is much, much greater than P1, I mean, you can assume the other way around also. If P2 is much, much greater than P1, then zeta becomes 1 by 2 under root A0 under root P2 over P1. Right. And if I want this to be 1, then P2 becomes 4 times A0 P1. So if I can satisfy this condition, then I will get a critically damp settling in our negative feedback system, second order negative feedback system. Okay. Does that make sense? Right. So this is why, I mean, so this is why I have been harping on, if you recall in previous classes before mid sem like what can we do to move the P1, P2 apart and so on, right? So reason was that eventually we would need that, need those understanding of what needs to be done to move the balls apart right so uh, so the requirement is this and let's assume that uh, a naught is 100 which means in this case p2 has to be 400 times away from p1 okay okay fine uh, any questions till now okay uh, so, so let's put everything on a let's put everything everything on uh, on the loop and plot and then try to try to figure out what's actually happening. So L become which means that if if uh, P one and P two are far apart, which means now your new P one is here, new P two becomes here. Which is four times n naught times p one. This is n naught. I need to uh, figure out where does this guy cut the? Where is the UGB of the loop? Is it before p two or after p two? Uh, knowing that I this is expressed as n naught by 
1 plus s by p1 1 plus s by p2. I think, okay, hold on. I probably missed something here. Did I miss something here? Oh, okay. So uh, one caveat here, I took the loop again to be this. Where, by, but I'm assuming that the A0 term includes the includes everything, right? A0 term is this, right? So A0 is not the DC gain of the common source amplifiers, right? It's DC gain of the common source amplifiers divided by three. Right, so, I mean, from the example that we took. So that is something that you should keep in mind. Okay, fine. So now uh, tell me uh, whether the question that I'm uh, asking is whether this omega u loop is before P2 or after P2. Do your calculations and tell me. Omega u loop is in not P1. I mean, how do you do? You basically do the same thing. You assume that it is in this segment. It is it is before P1, and then you uh, then you find out if it's before. Sorry, if it's before P2, and you find out, and then you get omega u loop to be omega a not P1. And since P2 is four times of that, it's quite clear that it will be before P2. So, which means that I can safely say this is here. And then it goes by 40 degree per decade. OK. OK, fine. So another way of uh, uh, another way of expressing uh, this constraint of P2 to be 4 times A0 times P1 is to say that P2 has to be 4 times omega u loop. Right for critically damped case in a second order system, right? So this is uh, one one might argue that this is this is equivalent to to this condition, which indeed it is. However, there is a uh, for a, from a designer's perspective, it's not particularly equivalent because let's say I increased uh, I increase the DC gain. Right, I can increase the DC gain in many ways. One of the ways is to simply say that I increase RD. Okay, right? so let me go back to the old circuit. Let's say, let's say I increase this RD, I increase this, the DC gain will increase. If I can, then DC gain will increase. Do you agree? Fine, so DC gain increased. What is going to happen to the locations of the poles P1, P2? Uh, my location of the P1 will decrease. Correct? Anything will happen to P2? Now, I haven't told you how I have, I'll realize P2 to be 4 times A0 times P1, right? But let's assume that uh, if the poles are supposed to be far apart, so this is C1, this is C2. If the poles are supposed to be far apart, and let's say I am not touching C2 or R, the second stage, uh, which means that I have to, what do I need to do? So in this case, P2, I know, right? What was P2? P2 was 1 over Rd C2, and P1 is 1 over Rd C1. Let's say I don't want to touch P2, but I want to impose that condition of poles are far apart. What should I do? P1 has to be smaller. I have to push P1 to a lower frequency. So what is the easiest way of pushing P1 to a lower frequency? Increase RD you can do, but can you increase RD to be like 100 times? I mean, from your experiences with, with the design, you cannot. Right. So, what is the best, easiest way to do that? Increase C1, which means you have to put some explicit capacitor on the first node to reduce the 
C1 uh, to reduce the location of the C1, right? So in other words, what I'm saying is that before before the, this addition of uh, extra P1, P, uh, extra capacitor, your loop gain, which was unstable, the loop was unstable, but in that case, at least you had locations of P1 and P2 to be close by, right? So there P2 was probably somewhere here and P1 and P2 were close by. This was going like this. Then in order to make it stable, we had to split the poles. And if we are further saying that I'm not moving P2, then I have to push P1 to a lower frequency because it's not easy to push poles to higher frequencies, right? It's easy to push poles to a lower frequency. So how can I push? I am pushing this P1 from here to here, and that can be done by adding an extra capacitor, right? So, so now, so essentially P1 becomes one by RD C1 plus C C where the C is the compensation capacitor, we call it compensation capacitor. So, so now essentially your, your new circuit becomes this was C1 and you add SEC. Okay, so now, now what I am trying to say, get at here is that now we are trying to increase the, increase the loop gain further. If we want to increase the loop gain further, we can increase the loop gain by increasing RD. I increased RD and that's all I am doing, right? I'm increasing RD further. So now in terms of loop gain, the loop gain will increase that I agree. But can you comment on what's going to happen to the locations of P1 and P2? Right, P1 will move to the left, it will move to the lower frequencies because it's inversely proportional to RD. Can you comment on what's going to happen on P2? Or is anything going to happen to P2? Why should P2 shift to the left? It seems like P2 will shift to the left because ZC gain is affecting P2. Correct? But that's the fallacy of algebra, right? You can express an expression with multiple in multiple ways. But in a circuit, and you look at the look at the circuit and comment if P2 will get affected. P2 is obviously due to the second capacity. I'm increasing the first RD. I'm increasing this one. P1 definitely moves to the lower moves to lower frequency, but will P2 get affected? It will remain same, right? Do you see that? P2 will remain same, right? So P2 will P2 will stay put wherever it was, but P1 will go to a lower frequency and A0 A0 will increase, which essentially means that this guy will become like this. This will be the new P1. Okay, that's the only possible solution because P2 is not moving. I need to keep that slope same, which means uh, P1 has to go to a lower frequency and DC again, DC again improves. Now, the reason I, I mean, couple of five minutes back, I made the made the statement that even though this equation and this equation essentially telling are identical, but they are not telling you the same thing because the equation on the top is probably telling you if I increase the DC gain, P2 moves. But it depends on how you change the DC gain, right? If I change the DC gain by the way I showed you, then P2 remains where it is, P1 moves. But does that change omega you loop? No, right? Because if P2 doesn't move and P1 is at far lower frequency, then omega loop doesn't really get affected, right? 
so essentially depending upon which how you are changing your uh, how you are changing the location of the poles you will have to make the call which equations to use do you want to use this equation or do you want to use this equation because if if, if somehow you can change the poles by moving p2 to a higher frequency then probably the top equation might be relevant but in the in our case we are not changing p2 since we are not changing p2 omega u loop isn't changing since omega u loop isn't changing then this condition of p2 to be four times omega u loop is a is a better metric is a better way of uh, better way of understanding what will be the location of the uh, what will be the relative locations of the poles so to summarize in the in one word a second in you know, one sentence the second order feedback system is stable if the second pole is four times that of the indicant frequency of the loop right if i have to be even more accurate i should say that a second order uh, system will have a critically damped response if the higher pole is at four times the unity gain frequency of the loop gain right again you have to, there are a lot of terms so i'm throwing here right so you have to keep those things in mind in the sense that this is critically damped under damped these are responses of the closed loop system loop gain is for an open loop system right so the locations of p1 p2 omega u loop are for open loop system but from looking at the responses of these open loop systems we are trying to figure out what will be the response of the closed loop system okay even though it's obvious ensure that you never miss that because i, still, I sometimes still see when uh, in, in classes students i mean put the closed loop and then find out the loop gain of a closed loop system and things mess up quite a lot uh, the reason we we do this open loop system and to closed loop system and, uh, this this uh, this this flow of analysis is because more often than not it is easy to find out the transfer function of a open loop system than a closed loop system in a closed loop system you have to write this multiple equations there are multiple loops you have to equate this to that and then find out something that is one problem in a closed loop, in an open loop system it's fairly easy in circuits at least because you can in more often than not you will see that you will be able to express as open loop system into um, cascades of first order systems a first order system is easy to visualize i can easily get the locations of the poles and the zeros by visualization right by inspection design is all about coming to a conclusion with minimal effort right so 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 it's easy to come to a conclusion based on if if i can if i can draw a line between how a closed loop system will respond if i look at the open loop system right so this analogy is required hence we don't go directly to the analysis of a closed loop system we go from from the path of open loop to closed loop another thing that you will see from the next class will be uh, this is only a second order system without any zeros right so then you you will be exposed to systems which are higher order because in reality it's not like we just because we know how to analyze a second order system everything will be second order right there is no compulsion uh, it will be it there will be higher order systems there will be third order fourth order systems with zeros without zeros and so on uh, so then a framework is necessary to analyze what's going to happen if an open loop system with so many poles and zeros are put in negative feedback so we'll see that we'll, we'll see that in next class okay okay let's stop it